Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's revived webinar by the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership, GARD-P. My name is Astrid penz -Moore, and I'm hosting today's webinar on assay development for measuring antibiotic accumulation in gram-negative bacteria. We had the pleasure to organize this webinar collaboratively with the Pew Charitable Trusts. Guard Peace Education and Outreach Program Revive was launched in 2018. It aims to connect and support the antimicrobial R&D community by facilitating learning, sharing knowledge and connecting people. All our webinars are recorded in full and can be viewed after the live broadcast on our website revive.gardp.org slash webinars. I also encourage you to look at this website to find announcements of future webinars, as well as other content, such as our antimicrobial viewpoint series. As always, um, our presentations will be followed by a Q&A session. You can submit your questions at any time during the webinar in this uh, questions panel, in your control um, panel. And we will do our best to address as many questions as possible after the presentations. Our moderator today is Alice Irwin. Alice is an independent scientific consultant providing advice on antibiotic discovery to academic and industrial research groups. She's a microbiologist with over 30 years of experience and her scientific research has revolved around the structure and function of bacterial membranes with particular interest in the contribution of lipopolosaccharides to both the pathogenesis and the intrinsic antibiotic resistance of gram-negative bacteria. Our speakers are Jessica Blair, David Six, and Mark Brunstrup. Welcome, Alice. I'm now handing over to you for a brief introduction of the speakers, as well as some background on the topic. Thank you, Astrid. Let's try this again. I'm sorry, you didn't have control yet. I will do this oh, okay. now. <laughs> okay, so our first speaker today will be Jessica Blair. She studied uh, biological sciences at Oxford University before moving to the University of Birmingham for her PhD. She uh, is moved up through the ranks at the University of Birmingham and now has her own research group investigating the molecular mechanisms of antibiotic resistance, in particular efflux. David Six is a principal scientist at Venatorix Pharmaceuticals, where he supports the clinical stage combination cefepime tenaborbactam and discovery stage novel non-beta-lactam inhibitors of penicillin binding proteins. He was previously at Novartis for over eight years, where he led antibacterial drug discovery programs and developed assays to measure bacterial compound accumulation. Mark Brinstrup heads the Department of Chemical Biology at the Helmholtz Center for Infection Research. Additionally, he holds a professorship at the Leibniz Universität Hanover. His research is focused on the discovery and the characterization of novel anti-infective drugs. This also includes the establishment of novel analytical and diagnostic methods. Before we start the main talks, I'll say a few words myself on why in discovering new antibiotics, we would like to measure the accumulation of compounds within bacteria. The plot you see in the bottom left is typical of a target, an early stage in a target directed program. You see a hundred or so compounds. The x-axis is in vitro activity towards the enzyme in IC50 and compounds are well down into the single digit nanomolar range, but most of them have no antibacterial activity. MIC on the y-axis is greater than 50 micrograms per, mi per mil. A few compounds have weak antibacterial activity, but the MICs are poorly correlated with the in vitro IC50s. We know why this is. Compounds vary in how well they reach the target enzyme, in this case in the cytoplasm, but we don't know how to design compounds to overcome the combined defenses of the outer membrane permeability barrier and the multi-drug efflux pumps. 
despite a lot of knowledge now about the structure and function of these transporters and channels. Our inability to improve compound uptake is one of the main reasons that antibiotic discovery projects are terminated. It would be extremely helpful to be able to measure the concentration of compounds within bacterial cells or to measure efflux directly, independent of their antibacterial activity. This would be useful in lead optimization, as in this plot, also earlier in a project during hit evaluation, or earlier still, designing libraries for screening. So you may say, haven't people been doing this already? And yes, there are papers from as far back as 30 or 40 years ago using radioactivity or sometimes intrinsic fluorescence to understand the process of uptake or the mechanism of resistance for antibiotics that were already in use, usually studying just one drug at a time. Much more recently, it became possible to study bacterial uptake using LCMSMS and then analyze the data for numerous compounds computationally to seek properties or motifs associated with increased uptake. You might remember last November a webinar in this series by Paul Hergenrother, who described such a study. However, the few large LCMS studies published so far do not provide information on where the compound is located within the bacterial cell. You may ask, why is this necessary at all? We have hundreds of antibiotics. Don't they tell us what are the right physicochemical properties for getting into bacteria? And yes, up to a point, we do know a lot. Many of you are probably familiar with the study by O'Shea and Moser from which this figure was taken. The left-hand plot has molecular weight on the x-axis and the gram-negative antibiotics shown in blue you see are smaller than the gram-positive antibiotics, on the whole smaller, the gram-positive antibiotics which are shown in red. The y-axis is C log D, and you see that most of the gram-negative antibiotics are lower in C log D or more polar than the gram-positive antibiotics. And most striking and an important finding of this study was that the gram-negative antibiotics are also much more polar than drugs in general, which are plotted as these smaller gray points in this big cloud up in the left. The right-hand panel shows essentially the same plot, but now color-coded by chemical class. Most of the 100 or so gram-negative antibiotics shown in this uh, plot belong to just five chemical classes. You might like to ask, within a chemical class or across classes, what are the properties that confer improved activity relative to potency? You can't tell that from these data, which don't include activity towards the various targets. And of course, all the compounds on this plot are actual drugs. So by definition, they get into bacteria pretty well and do inhibit their targets once they get there. So you can ask, what if we had a much larger study set, including experimental compounds? And this brings me to the SPARC database. This uh, database is sponsored by the Pew Trusts and is hosted in a CDD vault at Collaborative Drug Discovery. We have now uh, quite a large number of compounds in the database, over half of them, nearly 80,000, we have MIC values for. Quite a few of these came from target-directed programs and we have IC50 values for their respective enzyme targets. We have a smaller number where we have accumulation data and of course there are no standard assays for this yet. The compounds came from various sources, some from papers, most of them contributed more directly from the researchers, either um, including both academic and uh, industrial uh, labs. So let me now turn the uh, uh, control of the slides over to Jessica Blair to start her, her presentation. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, hello everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me to talk today. So in this webinar, we want to explore how we can measure accumulation of antibiotics inside bacterial cells. Um, this is really important because we want drug molecules to be able to reach and interact with their intracellular targets. And there are different ways to measure accumulation of compounds, and you're going to hear about some of them in, the, in some of the other talks today. But my talk is going to be slightly different because I'm not just going to talk about accumulation, but actually also focus on efflux. So accumulation of drugs inside bacterial cells. Slides aren't advancing. The accumulation of drugs inside bacterial cells is a balance between how much drug gets in and how much drug gets pumped back out again by efflux pumps. So for example, on the left-hand side of this slide, um, you can see um, if a drug doesn't seem to accumulate very well inside bacterial cells, it could be either because it doesn't penetrate the cells very well or because it's effluxed very efficiently or gets pumped out. Of course, what we ideally want to do is find drugs like on the right-hand side, where they get into cells very well, but are not pumped out or are only pumped out very slowly. So they accumulate intracellularly. And it's actually only by understanding these the details of these kinetics um, that we can understand why some drugs accumulate well and why others do not. And if we can understand this better, then in future we may be able to look for drugs that accumulate better or improve the balance between influx and efflux um, when developing the compounds. So one of the reasons gram-negative bacteria are so difficult to treat is shown nicely in this slide from the, the Pew Trust um, from a few years ago. Um, in gram-positive cells, it's relatively easy to get drugs to enter the cell through the single membrane structure, but in gram-negative bacteria, it's much more difficult and far fewer drugs, or far fewer molecules, sorry, are able to get through that double membrane structure, and particularly because the outer membrane has the structure um, making it very difficult for, for many compounds to get across. And of those molecules that can get in across that double membrane structure, um, many, many of them are then just pumped straight back out again um, by the multitude of efflux pumps that gram-negative bacteria have in their membranes. Efflux pumps are just molecular machines that sit in the membrane of bacterial cells and pump substrates from inside cells to outside cells. And then one of the things they can pump is antibiotics. There are many families of these efflux pumps. Um, the one, the family that's perhaps most important for what we're talking about today um, is the RND or resistance modulation division family of efflux pumps. Um, and that's because they're able to pump drugs of many different structural classes. So um, they can provide resistance to lots of different drugs at the same time. And what we see is that in drug resistant clinical isolates, you see really highly increased expression of these pumps um, because they're, they're pumping out drugs that um, the bacteria are, are resi providing resistance to, to the drugs that the bacteria are being uh, treated with. Now, in my research group, we're very interested in how efflux works um, and how it contributes to antibiotic resistance. So we spend a lot of time measuring accumulation, but also, um, importantly, dissecting out and measuring the contribution of efflux to the level of accumulation. Um, so I've been asked to try and answer this question, really. How can we measure the contribution of efflux to how much drug or compound accumulates inside bacterial cells? Now, the Revive program aims to facilitate drug discovery in all sectors, so I thought I'd briefly mention some simple techniques that are wide, with widely available equipment to help start to define um, the contribution of efflux that could be considered in all labs, from academia to small startups, all the way through to big pharma. Um, so one very simple way to try and determine whether efflux is an important factor in how much of a particular um, compound accumulates um, is to look at whether susceptibility to that compound changes in the presence or absence of efflux. Um, so looking, the, the first very simple thing and is to look at antimicrobial susceptibility. So um, on these slides here, um, there's just a pictorial representation at the top of um, an RND efflux pump and what happens if you inactivate the major components of the pump. Okay, so these are all drugs on the left-hand side that are known to be substrates of this efflux pump. This efflux pump is ACRA beta C. Um, and the details absolutely don't matter here, but this is antimicrobial susceptibility or MIC data. And what we see is that if we inactivate components of efflux pumps, um, then in this case, salmonella becomes far more susceptible um, to drugs 
um, the, the, the MICs get much smaller. Sorry, yeah, um, the MICs get much smaller. So um, by inactivating the major components of the efflux pumps in the, in the um, bacteria you're interested in, you can get some idea. If we look at this in the opposite way, if efflux pumps are overexpressed, which we know they very commonly are in, um, in drug-resistant clinical isolates, um, then susceptibility to compounds falls. Um, and so the MIC values increase. So the reason I've shown this is that using um, strains with manipulated uh, efflux, whether that's whether they've got less of it or more of it, um, and, and whether seeing whether the susceptibility changes, it's fairly crude, but it gives you some information about whether a particular compound you're interested in might well be subject to efflux. So if we move on to accumulation, and later on you're going to hear about some sophisticated method, methods to measure drug accumulation using mass spec. Um, in, in the spirit of the REVIVE program, I thought I'd briefly mention some simple techniques with widely available equipment to measure accumulation of compounds. And, and the technique here will set me up to then talk about how we're able to measure efflux. So the simplest way to measure accumulation um, is of, is to measure accumulation of compounds that can easily be detected. So um, these methods were set up using uh, fluorescent compounds initially and compounds which are um, differentially fluorescent inside and outside cells. So the graph you can see here is done using thidium bromide. So this is not fluorescent in um, uh, solution, but when it gets inside cells, it intercalates DNA and it becomes fluorescent. And you can, you can measure that. Um, so briefly here, what, what happens is you have a culture of growing cells it's washed and suspended in buffer, put in well plates, and then we can measure um, in a spectrophotometer or, or a plate reader, we can measure um, the, the fluorescence. So we, we inject the dye at the start, and what you can do is you can measure the increase in fluorescence as um, the compound accumulates within the cell. Um, and you can see here we have one strain that accumulates far less than the other, so we can start to see differences. Now advantages of this method include that it's cheap and easy, it's easily adaptable for different dyes or compounds um, and can be used to measure the accumulation of, of actually some drugs and with some alterations to this method um, this, this essential principle can be used to measure accumulation of, of drugs including the fluoroquinolones um, and other drugs that we're able to detect. Um, but it can also be used to give a the, an idea of the contribution of efflux to a particular compound. Um, the strains on this graph are actually um, uh, a wild type salmonella here and one lacking the major pump ACRB. Um, so you can see that um, in, in this shown in red here, the, the ACRB knockout can no longer efflux ethylene bromide efficiently, so it accumulates to higher levels within the cell. So it's not a perfect way to determine the role of efflux, but it does give us some information. Um, and in my group, we've recently adapted this idea using flow cytometry to measure the accumulation of fluorescent compounds in single cells. Um, I don't have time to explain all the details of how this works, but the, the reference is on the, the slide there, and I'm happy to answer questions on it. Um, importantly, using flow cytometry means you can rapidly measure the accumulation of a particular compound inside um, 10,000 or 20,000 cells within minutes. Um, and using that information, you can then either look at the um, average accumul accumulation across a population. So here you can see our a wild type salmonella versus an ACRB knockout, and you can see that the accumulation is much higher in the absence of efflux. And we can do this for all sorts of different strains to, to compare the, um, the accumulation level. Um, but also what's really nice about this method is that it allows you to see heterogeneity in the population. And what we can see for certain compounds is that all of the population of cells don't accumulate the same amount of compound. You see some um, bacterial cells accumulate far more than others. So you've got this heterogeneity in the population. And this is something, this is really important and something that we need to understand better um, because it's got potential implications for treatment efficacy and also for the development of resistance. So this is something that we're continuing to work on. So we finally make it to, to directly measuring efflux. So the very best way to understand how much efflux is contributing to accumulation is to actually measure it. Um, and I'm going to explain how we do this, but, it, but I will say it's not possible at the moment for, for all types of compound. So the graph I'm showing here is again using um, a fluorescent compound. This is a thidium bromide again. Um, so in principle, what you do in order to measure efflux is you um, 
preload the cells with a, as high amount of dye as, as you can. And the way we do that is using an efflux inhibitor. So we add a high concentration of, of our compound, in this case, a, a dye, um, and we use um, an efflux inhibitor, CCCP, carbonyl cyanide m chlorophenyl hydrazone, um, which dissipates the proton motive force. So what happens is the dye is getting, dye or compound is getting in, but you turn off the efflux pumps so it can't get back out again. Um, so they accumulate a lot, a lot of the dye. You then wash them to remove any remaining dye and to get rid of the inhibitor, um, and you measure fluorescence. So you can see the starting fluorescence here is high because we've given them as much dye as we can get into those cells. Then what we do is we inject glucose, which recharges the cell, you get restoration of the proton motive force, and efflux restarts. So if you look at this blue line here, what happens then is efflux restarts, and you can track the fluorescence as it as the compound is actively pumped out of the cell and by calculating the rate at which that happens we're actively we're measuring the the active efflux in real time um, and you can compare the rate of efflux in in different strains for example um, and so um, and, oh what's not Oh, no, there we go. Yeah, so again, here we've got um, a strain lacking um, the major reflux pump ACRB, or one with all of its reflux pumps. And you can see that for this compound, which is a thidium bromide, not a drug, but for this compound, you can see that um, we could fairly confidently say from this data that um, it is subject to reflux by, by this reflux system. So that's one quite nice way to show um, that a compound is subject to reflux. Now, there are problems and there are remaining challenges. Um, it would be difficult currently to scale up measurement of efflux to large scale drug screening programs. Um, but it might be possible to use this or similar approaches for lead compounds. Um, and, and importantly, currently we can only do this for, for compounds with certain characteristics. So compounds that we can um, detect easily by, for example, fluorescence. Um, however, it could be adapted. And one, one thing we could do is look at um, for a particularly compound, we could look at how well it um, competes for reflux with and with known efflux compounds so that there are things we could do there. It can be time consuming to optimise. We've done this for lots, quite a few different um, substrates, and it can take from weeks to months to get them to work well. So there are some challenges there. So just finally, in conclusion, then, um, efflux is a really key component of how much drug accumulates how much drug or compound accumulates within um, bacterial cells. Um, we should be looking for ways to quantify that better. And when we're considering new lead compounds, we should look for ones that are not subject to efflux or are pumped out very slowly so that we can maximize intracellular accumulation um, and also help prevent resistance. So um, in conclusion, efflux can be measured, but there are remaining challenges. Thank you very much. Oh, and finally, sorry, I should just say, thank you very much to these people for doing all this work. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Jessica. And David Six will give the next talk. Hi, thank you, Alice and, and Jessica. Uh, excellent introductions. Uh, I'm going to talk about compound permeation assays uh, with subcellular resolution. Uh, let's see if I have control. Great. So I'll start with a little introduction, and then I'll describe some of the work that was done while I was at Novartis uh, through 2018. Uh, more recently, I've been at Venatorix, where I've been happy to be able to continue some of these kinds of assay development strategies. Uh, in fact, one led to the other, uh, which is great. So let's see. So I think uh, both Alice and, and Jessica did a really excellent job describing the challenges of getting compounds in and avoiding efflux. But I wanted to use this slide to highlight the fact that while the outer membrane is definitely the primary permeability barrier in gram-negative bacteria, the inner membrane is also a permeability barrier. In addition, although RND efflux pumps uh, remove compounds from the periplasm and are, are absolutely clinically relevant. There are important intermembrane efflux pumps that remove compounds from the cytoplasm. So this means that compounds with cytoplasmic targets face additional obstacles to accumulation beyond those compounds with periplasmic targets. And what this leads to is it's really important to be able to measure subcellular accumulation of compounds. <clears throat> 
So when I when I started at Novartis um, shortly thereafter, one of the things that was pounded home time and again is that potent target inhibition is almost never enough. And, and our mantra was IC50 does not equal MIC. So the question that my group was challenged with was, can we define the molecular drivers of small molecule uptake to enable a structure permeation-based drug design? And can we visualize and quantitate small molecules crossing gram-negative bacterial membranes? So this was obviously an enormous challenge. Uh, and so what did we do with that? So in-house at Novartis, we developed a, a variety of biological tools similar to the kinds of things Jessica was just talking about with different strains. We developed orthogonal assays to um, MIC kinds of assays. We identified various chemical tools, both from the literature and in-house. And uh, we provided study design and scientific leadership, both internally as well as for external collaborations. These external collaborations um, were often about technology validation, technology development, and engineering. So on the bottom are the things that, that uh, we were looking at related to mass spectrometry, Raman spectroscopy, and nanoengineering. And in green are the ones that we've published or are writing up now. Um, we developed an LCMS, solid phase extraction MS methodology to determine whole cell accumulation. Uh, we also developed SIMS or secondary ion mass spectrometry to look at subcellular resolution. And um, those are both published and the references are, are mentioned below. We also looked at Raman spectroscopy. Uh, that's in preparation with, uh, in a collaboration with UC Davis as well as looking at nanofluidics, uh, the ability to capture bacteria into nanochannels and be able to measure compound going through the bacteria uh, from one side to the other of the bacteria. So all of these um, were really important and with the exception of SIMS did not provide subcellular resolution, which is really where we wanted to be. So uh, we had a fantastic uh, postdoctoral fellow at Novartis named Ben Spangler who developed this assay called BICEP. And this assay um, was developed to provide subcellular resolution of compound accumulation. The methodology takes advantage of bioorthogonal click chemistry. We expressed streptavidin in the cytoplasm or in the periplasm in two different strains. Streptavidin then guides the localization of a biotin cyclooctine probe. We can then incubate the cells with an azide-containing test compound, which if it gets into either of the compartments where streptavidin and the biotin probe are expressed, will react uh, in a click reaction and allow us then to um, uh, fix the cells uh, and do mass spectrometry to identify how much compound got into each of the subcellular localizations. Um, we can also analyze these same uh, cells with wild type efflux or with an efflux knockout, just as Jessica described. So this was a really valuable um, uh, tool for us at Novartis, but of course it was limited to azide containing compounds. In addition, it was a, a fixed endpoint assay that needed seven minutes per sample to run on the LCMS. And fortunately, my future colleagues at Venatorix read this paper with interest, but I'll get to that in a minute. So uh, after Novartis shut down its antibacterial drug discovery uh, programs, uh, I was fortunate enough to find a position at Venatorix Pharmaceuticals. Uh, our mission here is to discover and develop novel therapies to address critical needs in infectious diseases. We were founded in 2010 and currently have over 70 employees with experience in multiple therapeutic areas, including antibacterials, antifungals, and antivirals. We're an innovative drug discovery and development strategy here. We're in Malvern, Pennsylvania, and uh, we're primarily, at least my role, is primarily to target multidrug resistant bacterial infections. And we have a partnership with a variety of uh, governments, non-governmental organizations, academic institutions, and industry, including Guard P, as an example. So, um, what do we do, or what is what is what can I tell you that we do? Uh, so, our lead candidate is, as Alice mentioned, uh, tenibarbactam and uh, beta lactamase inhibitor in combination with cefepime, cephalosporin. That's currently in phase three clinical trials.
We also have an, an oral beta-lactamase inhibitor paired with ceftibutin that's beginning phase one clinical trials. And we have platforms to identify uh, penicillin binding protein inhibitors as well as a hepatitis B antiviral program. So when I got to Venatorix, I was really pleased to learn that Venatorix understood that understanding bacterial compound accumulation was a key part of antibiotic discovery strategies. And in fact, Venatorix had already been awarded an R01 grant to work on this uh, within the Venatorix libraries. So the R01 is for establishing a gram-negative permeability rule set, leveraging a unique small molecule library. What that library is, is uh, a boronate-based compound library um, that Venatorix has been developing with its clinical candidates. And those are shown uh, as VNRX5133 or Tanibor-Bactam, which is a pan-beta-lactamase inhibitor as well as VNRX5236, which is the active compound of our oral beta-lactamase inhibitor program. And of course, these are just two examples of the boronate-based compounds in the Venatorix library. The library does have a, a wide range of structure types and physical chemical properties. We want to act, investigate both activity-dependent, like an MIC, and activity-independent measurements, like mass spec, of compound permeation and accumulation to then be able to generate quantitative structure activity relationships for accumulation as a function of those molecular properties. And we'll then apply these learnings to uh, our internal penicillin binding protein inhibitor projects to improve MIC potencies of these lead compounds. So here's a snapshot of the Venatorix library. Um, we have uh, over a thousand beta-lactamase inhibitors and 700 penicillin binding protein inhibitors in the library. And the library uh, for these two subtypes is similar in that they're both bicyclic benzoic acid, cyclic boronate rings, and, uh, but medicinal chemistry efforts are embedded diversity into each of the series based on size, polarity, lipophilicity, charge, and flexibility. And in fact, considering that they're all cyclic boronates, there's actually quite a, a large variety of differences in polarity, in van der Waals volume, in molecular weight, and in dipole. So um, the Venatorx team uh, realized that the chemical sensors had been described that became fluorescent upon forming a complex with boronic acids. So that's shown here. These chemical sensors can bind boronic acids and form a new fluorophore. So there's no fluorescence without the boronic acid. The boronic acid binds, and then we get fluorescence. So as Jessica pointed out in her talk, there are several advantages to fluorescence assays. The question is then how best to take advantage of fluorescent boronate sensors in the context of an accumulation assay. So as I mentioned before, when, when I arrived at Venatorix, I was really excited to learn that we had this R01 uh, grant to look at accumulation assays. And more specifically, the day I arrived, I was excited to learn that my, com my colleagues had already discussed adapting the Novartis bicep assay that I talked to you about earlier. This time, not to detect azide-containing molecules, but rather to detect boronate-containing molecules. So our, our strategy is shown here. Again, we'll utilize the streptavidin expressed in the periplasm or the cytoplasm. We would load cells with a uh, pre-fluorescent uh, biotin boron sensor conjugate. Then we would add the boronate compounds and monitor accumulation using fluorescence. And that would be, again, with two different strains, a periplasmic strain and a cytoplasmic strain. And ideally, we'd be able to obtain, obtain a time course of subcellular accumulation for uh, compounds in intact cells. So as, a, as an early proof of principle, I'm showing some controls that we've been doing. And so this is fluorescence detection of phenylboronic acid, a very simple boronic acid. Uh, down here, you can see a biotinylated 
uh, pre-fluorescent uh, sensor that will be able to bind to a boronate containing compound to form now a competent fluorophore. And as you can see, this, this um, linker has no fluorescence intrinsically in the absence of uh, the example compound phenylboronic acid. But upon incubation with phenylboronic acid, there's excellent uh, fluorescence enhancement. And indeed, this fluorescence is dose dependent uh, with phenylboronic acid. And so we're really excited to see this. And so our future work or our ongoing work is to execute our studies with the subcellular localized boron sensor technologies, uh, synthesize perhaps a series of biotin linked boron sensor compounds uh, to compare uh, their yields, and then utilize fluorescence based assays to quantitate compound accumulation, both with rates as well as subcellular localization. So in summary, how can ass new assays impact antibacterial discovery? So bacterial compound accumulation assays for diverse unlabeled compounds may enable structure accumulation relationship models. So one of the assays I didn't talk about is the Novartis backpack assay, which is a 96-well assay format that utilizes solid phase extraction mass spectrometry to enable important controls and replicates. But this yields whole cell accumulation results. Uh, which may or may not be relevant to the targets of interest. In addition, measuring subcellular accumulation kinetics uh, should improve structure accumulation relationship models. So the Novartis BICEP assay provides subcellular resolution of azide compounds with streptavidin probes using endpoint mass spectrometry readouts. So the next phase of this is the Venatorix assay, which should enable subcellular resolution again, of boronate-containing compounds with those streptavid and biotin probes using live cell fluorescent readouts. So I really want to acknowledge both my colleagues at Novartis uh, who generated the publications that I've uh, touched on or, or referenced for you. Uh, and that was work done all in the group of Jennifer Leeds. And now at, at Venatorix, where I am now, um, the work I showed is that of Colin Myers, Nathan Line, and Siyoshi Wahara, uh, but with a great leadership team here at Venatorix, and it's been a real privilege to be here. So at that, I think I can hand off to the next speaker. Hey, David, thanks very much and uh, for a great talk. And uh, Mark, you're up next. <laughs> Yeah, hello everyone. Welcome from my side. Uh, it's my pleasure to report on our efforts to study uh, the accumulation of antibiotics in gram-negative bacteria. We are mostly using mass spectrometry to do so, and uh, today I will only speak about, say, unmodified molecules. So, so we only have techniques that do not require, say, a modification of the drugs. And I'll present two assays in the First one is shown on the next slide. Hmm. Click again. I hope I have control over the slides, but I can't see it moving. You have control. Maybe you want to click once more. If not, then I will advance ah. the slides for you. All right. Ah, okay, yes, here it is. So the first essay we have developed or adapted is uh, again a whole cell accumulation essay that works in 96 well plates and uh, it uh, builds on the method that has been reported by Kai et al. So, so we grow cells at a defined OD and then we add antibiotics at different time points uh, with a, yeah, and time span before we uh, apply a rapid filtration using a, man, a vacuum manifold. And then after a couple of washing steps, uh, we redissolve the compounds and then uh, we quantify uh, uh, yeah, the molecules in the whole cell uh, using uh, LCMS, using a triple quarter pole that is shown on the bottom right. And what we obtain in this manner are kinetic curves. And I show you an example on the next slide. Um, 
This is from an IMI enabled uh, program, and I have to say, not written the names of the compounds, and I yeah, saw so the, the curves are, uh, are a bit small. Let me describe what can be seen. First of all, the compound accumulation is relatively rapid, so you see uh, reaching the accumulation reaching a maximum after, say, short time spans of mostly 10 or 15 minutes. However, the curves are quite different depending on the compounds. Here, they all come from one series. But what we observed is that some members, as the one on the bottom right here, show a steady uh, increase of uptake, whereas others reach a plateau immediately or even show a, 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 a slow decrease of accumulation over time. So, so this is quite interesting. We also studied uh, the influence of efflux here. So you see two curves and the upper curve is mostly from an E. coli delta tall C strain. And here again, you can see that whereas some compounds show a pronounced difference in uptake between wild type and an efflux impaired strains, this is not the case uh, for other compounds. And what is difficult to recognize is that uh, the absolute amount of uptakes differ quite substantially even uh, within members of a class. So, so this is an essay with this 96 uh, well-played throughput that is good to compare, say, a larger panel uh, or yeah, a larger group of compounds within a series. But for the rest of the talk, I'd like to already uh, come to our second essay, and this is a fractionation essay that goes into further detail as described by Astrid. It tries to capture uh, compound concentrations in, in different bacterial compartments. So we first uh, uh, separate the cytoplasm, the periplasm, and the membrane fractions of a bacterium, and then quantify the compound concentration again using uh, uh, LC-MS-MS um, in, in these separate fractions. And the large advantage of this additional step is that we can then uh, conclude on the compound concentration at the molecular target. So if you know in which compartment your target is expressed, you can judge whether this is uh, the compound accumulation is sufficient uh, to reach or surpass IC50s or not. Let me briefly explain uh, how the method works. Uh, so we apply first uh, a hyperosmotic buffer that contains sucrose, which is taken up into the periplasm. In the second step, uh, a hyperosmotic buffer uh, induces an osmotic shock, which leads to the release of uh, the periplasm. So, so we collect this fraction. And then um, uh, the, the remainder is simply uh, sonificated and then uh, separated using ultracentrifugation into a membrane fraction and a cytoplasm fraction. This protocol has been adapted from, say, earlier protocols uh, developed for proteomic research. Um, and of course, the question is, does this work at all? We validated this open on, um, through some marker proteins uh, using Western blots. So um, we, we used, say, a protein that is specifically expressed in the periplasm, the maltose binding protein, and you can see that indeed you observe after fractionation, after generation of the fraction, we observe the signals uh, exclusively in the periplasm. GROW-L is a cytoplasmatic protein, and you can see here that there's a little remainder also in the other fraction. So, so it's, uh, we have a clear enrichment uh, uh, of the protein in, in the cytoplasm fraction, but separation is not perfect. And finally, the membrane for, to capture the membrane fraction, we applied uh, OMB-A as a marker protein and detected it by Western blot. And again, you see, uh, see most the accumulation in the membrane. And here on the very right, you see just the result of, of a whole cell assay. So our fractionation is not perfect, but it leads to a good, significant um, enrichment of the fractions. This, that if we then do the LCMS assay, we, we uh, get a information 
that we, we get a quantity, we get to say peak amount of picograms in a certain number of cells. But as I said, the really important information is the concentration. And to uh, calculate the concentration in the compartment, we need to know the volumes of the compartment. And this we extracted from the literature. So, so we uh, took from two papers the dimensions of the E. coli cell, as well as information on, say, meter of the membrane and, and the thickness of the periplasm fraction, which uh, can then lead to, say, the, the volume uh, of, of different subcompartments. And in this manner, you can, say, transform amounts to concentrations. And the result is uh, shown here with, say, a standard compound ciprofloxacin. in this has been used in many innovation studies. So in, in terms of overall amounts, you, you see that the majority of compound resides in the cytoplasm. Um, the other thing you see is that if we sum up the amount of compounds in all fractions, the result is pretty similar to uh, the, the quantities we, uh, we get in a simple whole cell assay. So, so this is good, so we don't lose a lot. Um, actually, what is not written here, the, the gray bars are the delta tall C strain and the white bars are Y type strain. However, if you now convert it to concentrations, the, the relative height of the bars looks different. So indeed, the highest uh, concentration of uh, ciprofloxacin resides in the periplasm and, and not in the cytoplasm. This is because the periplasm is smaller. So, so it's indeed uh, worth to have a look at, say, both these pictures. And um, what you can do then with this, uh, say, data is, of course, to compare uh, compound accumulation with your MIC data. And well, here one would say, okay, we have about three times more uh, compound in the delta tall C strain than in the wild type strain. And this nicely reflects the differences in MICs uh, uh, for ciprofloxacin. We did this also for other standard antibiotics. I show three more examples. Uh, here I show a trimetoprim, a little bit more in the uh, delta tall C strain than in the wild type. And indeed, the, the MIC is a bit lower. So again, a nice match. However, if you look at tetracycline, this was not an... Uh, um, here we don't observe uh, flux effects. The, the accumulation data are more or less equal, although we observe a clear difference of a factor of more than two in MRCs. So this made us uh -huh, already wonder, and we wondered even more if we looked at erythromycin. You know, erythromycin is not good at killing gram-negative data. Here are our MIC uh, data against the E. coli wild type, 33 microgram per ml. However, it's prone to efflux. This is also known. So the delta tall C MIC is quite good, below one micromolar. And now we uh, applied this uh, accumulation assay even in a time-dependent manner. So, so we, we sampled after various time points. And, and of course, we're maybe looking for this uh, difference of whatever factor 50. And we never observed it. So, so if you look at the difference after one hour, yes, there is more compound in the delta tall C strain than in the wild type, even more pronounced after three hours. But over time, this difference kind of uh, diminishes again. And um, after 24 hours, so after the time point when you read out the MICs, concentrations are quite comparable. So this is remarkable. So uh, uh, pronounced mismatch between, say, accumulation differences and MIC differences. And I come back to this in the, my, say, summary slide. Here's just one uh, slide that summarizes uh, where we are and what we want to do next. Also, we have extended this method that I so far only described for E. coli to other priority uh, pathogens. So we now have Pseudomonas, uh, Klebsiella, Acinetobacter, and also a protea species. And we also have a specialty uh, assay that could measure compound accumulation in mitochondria, and now we are also looking at mycobacteria. We need some tricks to alleviate matrix suppression for some analytes. We're working on that. And well, an obvious shortcoming is that so far we quantify the inner and the outer membrane together. This, of course, 
the two max uh, sense, uh, it's a big difference whether a compound just sticks at the outside of the cell or whether it really, uh, say, penetrated or to, also already to the inner membrane. So we have to take those uh, two compartments apart. And, and on top of that, we're also working on a method uh, for covalent binders, for example, beta lactams. So there we have to couple with proteomic techniques. And so far, we only looked at the parent drug inside the cell. Of course, you can also look at metabolites in, in the cell. And, and this is yeah, what we're working on. Um, I'd like to summarize. I've shown you two methods uh, that are useful to understand, uh, uh, to improve our understanding of MICs by uptake measurements, the whole cell measurements, and, and the cell, subcellular fractionation approach. But I already highlighted that uptake, these simple uptake data alone do not explain differences in MIC. So right, I think we have to get much more information, for example, on target abundance. We need to know how many target molecules exist per cell. And also an interesting mechanistic question, what kind of target occupancy is required to, to kill the cell? So is it sufficient to inhibit 30% or 85%? And this, of course, the varies target by target. And you may also wonder whether there are off-target effects of antibiotics that contribute then to cell, ceiling, so cell killing. Sorry. So I, I think, although these uh, essays already took a uh, well, a substantial effort. I think we need a much more pronounced and, and refined uh, information to really understand what leads to, to cell killing and to an MIC. And so and this is, I think, uh, food of thought for, for many uh, researchers. Yeah, with this, uh, I'm at the end, but I'd like to acknowledge uh, a lot of people in the group. So the first essays have been developed by Verena Fetz, Hans Prochno, and the, these three guys, and Kevin, Hazel, and Bettina, are currently working in the team. We get a fourth member. I'd like to, uh, very soon on this, um, I'd like to thank a lot of our collaborators from the IMI program, from Ibutech, and those who provided the funding. And maybe one last hint, we still have one open position. So if you're interested, I would be happy to yeah, get in contact with you. Thanks for your attention. Thanks very much, Mark. And we'll be opening this to questions now. Uh, you can see the slide that shows how to submit a question. We already have several questions and some are coming in to just one speaker specifically and others uh, are general questions. We'd like to have this be, <clears throat> excuse me, discussion as much as possible. So I will uh, kind of direct the questions in, in uh, different directions. Um, the first one though is specifically for Jessica Blair. Um, with regard to your slide showing the MICs with um, different pump components knocked out, um, the questioner noticed that Triton in particular was not, the MIC was not affected by knocking out ACRA. And can you say something about that? Yeah. Um, so Triton, Tricky one, actually. Whether or not that's a substrate, I think it's probably slightly unclear. Um, we know that knocking out um, Tulsi does change the um, the uh, susceptibility, but um, what I would say is that knocking out different components of the pump does give different effects. And we've seen particularly when you knock out components, the, the proplasmic component of the pump, um, sometimes you get less of an effect than you do with some of the other components. And partly that's because there's more than one proplasmic adapter protein in the, in the bacteria um, and they can use ones from other pumps as well. So yeah, we do see subtly different effects depending on which component is inactivated. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is, was asking specifically about efflux, but it really, um, I want to direct it to everybody. And uh, yeah, Astrid's reminding me I should put my web webcam back on. But the question is about gram-positive bacteria. We've been talking about gram-negative, but 
it can be hard to get compounds into gram net gram positives they have pumps and is there some equivalent to the toll c strain or how do we think about gram positives mm -hmm. whoever wants to go first i can go yeah so so gram positives do have efflux pumps um, they don't have anything of the similar of the same family. The RND pumps, um, particularly, uh, they're found only in gram negs. They um, because they span that double membrane structure, and Tol C is found in that out in the outer membrane. So there isn't anything that is um, structurally similar in in gram positives. But they do have efflux pumps of other classes, and yes, they do contribute to um, export of antibiotics. Um, but but not the R&D pumps. Okay, uh, David and Mark, you want to add to that? Yeah, I would just add that that certainly uh, those pumps are generally not uh, essential, and so there are knockouts in all of the gram positive strains that you'd be interested in um, to do similar things to what Jessica talked about uh, with gram negatives. Mm -hmm. The gram positive pumps tend to be narrower in substrate specificity. Is that right? Okay. So there are some technical questions about the need to wash cells, um, keeping them, this is specifically for Mark, but maybe also um, for the others, worrying about compounds being effluxed back out while you're manipulating them. Do you keep cells at four degrees? Things like that. Can you say something, Mark? Mm. Yeah, that, that's definitely a concern. Uh, so if you, say, remove compounds from the outside, uh, if, if you have, uh, say, also an equilibrium between inside and outside, uh, I, I'm sure there will be a back diffusion of compounds. So um, we try to, say, counterfeit them by, by being fast, by, mm -hmm. by Using a lot of time, and, and uh, in, indeed, our first versions of the assays had, say, very slow filtration and washing steps, and, and the data were a lot more variable. Um, what makes us say confident that uh, our results are not completely random are these kinetic curves. So, uh, if, if we have just one time point or one data point, just a number. Could be terribly wrong however that we see this constant increase over time and, and then this plateau shape makes us confident that um, we may have an error here but uh, the error is comparable between um, uh, between different uh, uh, time points and, and therefore believe that a conclusion is justified although we yeah we definitely lose something by washing no doubt uh, related to that is the incubation time with the bacteria, and this I think go, goes for all three speakers, um, mostly as you showed in the kinetic curves, compounds, most of the compound is in there by 10 minutes or so, and is there an ideal time to pick if you were only going to do one, is the kinetics the critical thing? And I was especially surprised to see your incubations of ours, but what do people think about the um, the timing of uh, incubation of bacteria with compound? Depends on the compound, I would say. Um, it's our experience. Um, with some of our assays, yes, you can get away with a reasonably short incubation time. With others, you need to pick, particularly if you're, if you, when, we me when you're measuring efflux, and what you're trying to do is get that really high initial loading of the cells. Um, it, you know, um, depend, depending on the substrate that we're using, um, we can be talking hours to, you know, to, to multiple hours overnight. Um, um, so it, it kind of depends on the compound and, and you have to, uh, we've found with our assays, we've had to optimise that as we go. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of multiple doses and multiple time points when that's feasible. Uh, I think all of us are. Um, and depending on the, the throughput and the methodology, uh, you know, LCMS is, is provides uh, kind of seven minutes per sample is a bit much. 
Um, but when, when we go into higher throughput fluorescence readout or solid phase extraction MS, we can trim that down to seconds per sample, and I think that's much more reasonable. Um, mm. So kinetics is great. I, I don't think that, uh, except for the reasons that Jessica said to go into hours, uh, I think for uh, initial equilibrium kind of reaching that one doesn't want to go past sort of an hour because then you start changing the cells if there's an antibacterial target, might be um, precipitating on membranes, things like that I would worry about. But that sort of under an hour time window is is what I would look at for kinetics. Hmm. Yeah, well, we have also, say, started, or we felt most comfortable with shorter time points. This seems to be the most important uh, time range. And of course, we were also afraid of, say, antibiotic effects, especially if you investigate antibiotics. So we were afraid of dosing high, uh, and especially with uh, bactericidal compounds. But uh, so we also checked with ICFU uh, measurements whether we just say destroy bacteria, and then, of course, then our say concentration measurements wouldn't make sense. But actually, this is not the case. Even with uh, so, so we try to remain uh, below uh, IC50 if possible. But we even uh, found uh, for, for some compounds it was necessary to go a bit higher because they could. Uh, couldn't be detected uh, so well. But if even if you go above, say, IC50 or uh, MIC, but do it just for a short time, it doesn't have too much effect on growth because yeah, your growth readout is mostly after whatever 18 hours or so, uh, whereas the, the exposure to within the first hour doesn't cause, say, uh, too much harm to the ensemble yet. But, but still, yeah, the, the the answer is correct. I think the first hour is the most important uh, time. Span. And I think your answer about um, checking the viability, if, if you're going any longer than that, is really important when you're developing these assays. You need to make sure that, that any effect you're seeing is not because you're killing stuff. So mm -hmm. and, and just to provide a little two cents on some compound classes that gave problems, uh, the polymyxin class causes mm -hmm. a very rapid lysis. <laughs> And, and that would in, and destroy the integrity of the cells uh, as well as the CFU count. And, and the fluoroquinolone class uh, provided a drop of CFUs, but we found that actually the cells were still intact. So um, even with bactericidal compounds, uh, you get different flavors. Um, but again, the, the shorter time, even with high concentrations, is usually fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me... Look through this. Um, a question about the sensitivity of this is specifically for Dr. Blair. Uh, the writer loves the simplicity of the techniques you talked about. And can you talk about the sensitivity of using fluorescent plate readers for the assays you describe? And um, what kinds of uh, chemicals will can be used in these assays and what sort of numbers of uh, bugs do you use to get measurable effects? We don't want to spend too much time on technical details, yeah. but at the same time, people are anxious to put these things into practice. Sure, and, and so, so sensitivity is, is, is an important issue. And, and I think that, is, and sensitivity of the method then drives how many cells you end up putting in. This is one of those things that we've had to optimize, and, and there are papers out there, people optimizing this, and um, often it's to do with getting um, cells to, a diluting cells to a particular ID. We have protocols that we have to share that, that, that um, about how many cells we put in per well, so that we know for each compound, we, we, we know what, what sort of concentration of cells we need to be able to detect um, accumulation. Now, I would say something like using a fluorescent plate reader, um, you know, there is a limit of that sensitivity, and that has to be taken into account. Using something like flow cytometry, which I talked about as well, um, the sensitivity of that with, with many of the compounds is much greater. Um, so so you, you can do other things, and I'm sure mass spec is more, um, more sensitive again. Um, so you know, it's a trade-off. You, you can get around it if you um, develop the assays with that in mind. Mm 
Jessica, can I follow up and, and ask, what about background fluorescence from the cells, depending on what media you grew them in? Do you yeah. have any, any thoughts on that? Absolutely. So um, that's a real problem, particularly if uh, what we find is that um, uh, many of the compounds we use have a, a you get fluorescence of, the, of, of something like LB media, you get fluorescence at about in that range. So what I would always say is that whatever media you grow it in, you want to get rid of the media. So you want to spin it down, you want to wash it in a buffer, um, spin it down and respend it in that buffer again if you can. Speed is of the essence, as we were talking about before. So I think, you, you know, that there's a trade-off there between um, what, because what you don't want is to spend so much time washing and spinning it that everything's been fluxed. So, um, but yeah, I think growth media is a really important one and I would try and eliminate it from, from the actual assay that you're reading. The other, the other way you can go is to use a defined buffer media uh, that, that will have much lower intrinsic fluorescence uh, than LB or, or some of the um, biological-based broths. Yeah, and then if, you, if you've got something that's got lower fluorescence and they grow in well, depending on your species, grow well enough in it, then you can just subtract that background, I guess, but then you come into sensitivity problems. So again, it, it's about playing with it as well. So I have a question about Pseudomonas, where we know generally MICs run higher than for E. coli. And for those of you measuring accumulation, you see in, uh, in parallel that there's less accumulation of compounds within Pseudomonas than E. coli or Salmonella. Mm -hmm. You're yes. nodding. Yeah, it's, I think there's two things to that. Uh, it's got a particularly impermeable membrane, Pseudomonas, and it has a phenomenal number of R&D flux pumps. Something like Salmonella has um, five R&D flux pumps, E. coli has six, Pseudomonas has, th it, it depends, but about 13. So, um, you know, harder to get stuff in, much more stuff gets pumped out. Another question, we all use tall C mutants as you know, kind of the simplest efflux mutant, but are they, you're affecting other things also, do they have membrane impairments that are confounding your, your data? So we were very um, worried about that at Novartis. And so we've published two or three papers now where we knocked out the, um, the efflux pump part. So like ACR, AB, ACR, EF, and we knocked out all eight of them from from the genome to see if that matched Tol C or if Tol C was still worse, and we tested you know hundreds of compounds and found that the MICs for that um, we ended up knocking out nine different things because you have to knock out enterobactin as well. So we had a nana pump knockout or nine pump knockout, and it was equivalent to Tol C for 99.9% .9 of compounds. Uh, I'll, there was one exception, but we didn't understand what that was. But we don't think it was an outer membrane permeability defect. And Mark, do you have thoughts on that? Uh, I, I think I, I know Nova Pidor has worked uh, a lot on that, so Jessica may the best, be the best uh, person to comment. So we are aware that it's. Um, that we introduce a bias by simply t taking this simple knockout strain, but we haven't worked in this direction. So it's, yeah, we haven't. Well, I would say that MIC-wise, um, <sighs> knocking out Tol C is, is a, you know, a sensible move in some ways because the outer membrane channel for most of the RNZ pumps. Um, biologically, the effect is quite different. Um, so for example, um, there are studies that have looked at transcript the transcriptome of um, various species of bacteria without the, without Tol C, and it's quite a different transcriptomic response to losing Tol C as it is to losing the pump components of the system, um, and again different to, to to losing the proplasmic adapter protein. Um, I think if you've got to choose one, and and you know in drug in a drug development setting, you you know you, you can't do everything, and I think if you're going to choose one thing to knock out, I think Tol C is a smart move. Um, it depends on the question you're asking, and I think if if you're asking questions about biology, you might want to think more carefully about exactly what the what, what it is you're asking by only using a Tol C mutant. Um, but for drug discovery, probably a Tol C mutant is a sensible shout. So I'll just put out a, 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 a kind of mention that uh, NIAID is providing, has obtained and is providing the Novartis strains, for example, the eight or nine efflux knockout strain 
through ATCC slash BEI. They'll, they'll be available hopefully later this year. Um, thanks to Anne for putting that together. So that should be a great tool set. Um, I have uh, somebody asking about expression of efflux pumps changing with repeated subculture. And this may be asking about whether incubation with sub-inhibitory antibiotic affects efflux pumps. It could also be just the, what's growth stage? How do you want, what state do you want your bugs in when you do these assays? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's. I, I think that's an important point. Um, in in order to get sufficient signal, we our bacteria need to be cultivated to a certain stage. So so we usually uh, start at an OD of uh, zero point eight. So so they're, they're at a relatively late mature stage. So so this is. Um, yeah, it definitely has an impact. And um, we have never, say, checked by a flux pump uh, expression, but but we, we see a lot of effects at uh, sub-MIC exposure. So so we looked, uh, we had, say, comparative transcriptome metabolome studies, and, and, and it's true, even at concentrations, what we call a NIC, a non-inhibitory concentrations, where, where there's absolutely no effect on growth. We so pronounced changes of both, the, say, the metabolome, secondary metabolome of, of the pathogen, as well as uh, on, on the transcriptome. Although I, I, I'm not aware of uh, efflux being prominently regulated because there's no, say, antibiotic pressure yet, but um, for sure, per se, the effects are already there. Mm -hmm. So efflux expression can, you know, can change, and um, uh, by by growing it repeatedly with the with the subinhibitory concentration of a drug, you are likely to to induce efflux, depending on how long you're talking about um, doing that for. You know, if if you do it long enough to start selecting for um, mutants, then what you're going to select for is regulatory mutants that overexpress the efflux pumps, and that's relatively easy to do. So it's something that you do need to think about, um, if, depending on the time scale of your experiments. Um, and and so I, I guess in, in, in essence, I would say the answer is is yes. If you are growing them with a subinhibitory concentration of drug, then the efflux expression could change. And depending on what your question is, um, you, you might want to think about whether you need to measure that or not. I would just add um, that if you're using a, a clinical isolate or a mutant that has upregulated its efflux through mutation, uh, passaging that in the absence of selection will tend to select for loss of that overexpression of efflux. So it's really important that you're monitoring your strains for the persistence of that phenotype that you that you assume that they have. Um, because you don't want to be surprised by having passaged it on, on plates or into glycerol stocks and having lost that overexpression of efflux. And, and I, I want to add one more thing. We often think about MIC, so I think accumulation assays should be done in conditions that, to the best of our abilities, mimics an MIC. And that's why at Novartis and, and here at Venatorix, I've, I've said that cation adjusted Mueller Hittenbroth is what we should be growing the cells in uh, for all our accumulation assays because that's what we use for our MIC assays. And maybe that's too cautious, but and sometimes it's not possible, uh, but that would be the, the preference, I would say. The other thing I would say on that is that, it, you know, you, the other way to look at it is that you could try and mimic infection-like conditions. Be, you know, uh, would be the other side to look at that. So, and it, and it does change depending on how you grow the bacteria and what, what media you grow them in, how long you grow them for. The accumulation will change. So, you know, one way, one thing we try and do sometimes is try to grow them in, in, in conditions that mimic what would it would be like during infection and see what the accumulation is like in that setting. Okay, thanks. I have a couple of uh, kind of technical questions for David Six. Uh, one of which is about the boronate um, reactivity. 
how many compounds are likely to react with boronates? I am trying to understand the range of chemicals that can be studied using this technique. And also is the permeability of the cell to boronates a factor here? So um, we have a range of, of compounds with boronates that are both either hydrophobic or, or polar. And um, that, that drives things getting in more than the boronate itself. The boronate is not a, a special uh, moiety that gets you in. Uh, everything else plays a much more important role. Um, the boronate reactivity um, is, is low to most everything that a bacteria has or would be growing in. Uh, the boronate, depending on the boronate, it will be exchanging with water in a hydrate form. So water will be coming on and off. Uh, if you have a cyclic form, it will be ring opening and ring closing. Um, but there aren't any transformations that are occurring under physiological conditions in the bacteria or in the broth that we're using. And the binding to the sensor uh, is a, it, it, while covalent is not uh, changing the molecule, there's no chemistry going on in that sense. It's more of a chelation type interaction. Okay, thank you. And then um, also on the uh, localization, do the your probes have different fluorescent wavelengths? Can you test if the fluorescence is coming from the periplasm and the cytoplasm at the same time? How do you differentiate the two? Yeah, so that's an important point. Um, we have not developed yet a way to uh, localize two different probes in the same cell. Uh, in principle, one could do that, um, but having two different cells uh, in parallel, I think, is the way to go. Having a, a streptavidin expressed and localizing the, the biotin probe into the cytoplasm in one cell and the periplasm in another cell, that's, that's what we're going to be pursuing uh, here. Uh, I think it would get really complicated to try to develop another kind of localization sink uh, that wasn't biotin-based um, because we wouldn't be able to differentiate. Biotin's going to find streptavidin, so if we had two different probes, they'd go everywhere um, following the biotin. Okay, so now I have a general question. What is the relationship between target binding and intracellular accumulation? Do you think that accumulation rates change when there is intracellular stress? And would measurements at the one hour time point be measuring normal versus stress related entry? And this uh, just came in, so it's sort of following your previous discussions on how to do these. Yeah, I think. I think influx rate could could well change because we know one one way the bacteria, uh, one mechanism of resistance is is to limit. Um, how much drug gets in. So there's physiological changes in the membrane that, that, that limit influx. So yes, it's possible. And, and as soon as a cell is in contact with a drug for any length of time, there is going to be some stress response. So I guess, I guess yeah, it's possible. I think, Alice, you probably can speak to this, but certainly yeah. inhib inhibition of LPXC as an example can change the membrane permeability and, and have a, a sort of a feed forward uh, enhanced permeation. So mm -hmm. if you're altering um, the, the membrane permeability, then absolutely you'll be changing that permeability as more and more compound gets in and inhibits those targets. I, I would also say that there's definitely say uh, a feedback. So, so the response is not at all say independent from the uptake. There are also more sophisticated mechanisms like the self-promoted uptake of aminoglycosides. So, so there it goes in the, in the in the other direction. So rather than having a defense reaction that then limits uptake, you you reach the opposite. There's more and more uptake. The, uh, the, the more antibiotic is in. So, but yeah, this has definitely be to, uh, to be taken into account. And therefore, again, just say looking at a single time point may is, is uh, bears the risk that you, that you miss these phenomena. 
I think there are a couple other questions buried in there, and, and, and one of them I heard was, does the amount of target influence the cytoplasmic accumulation, for example? And we were concerned about that, so for a variety of different uh, series, we overexpressed or diminished the target uh, and, and found that that had very little effect on accumulation. Um, but it, there's always the possibility, uh, and I think maybe it's more likely with periplasmic uh, overexpression of things that one might get a sink because you'd, you'd retard the uh, diffusion during your wash steps, for example, uh, if you are bound to lots of targets in the periplasm. Well, and in fact, if you calculate, as Mark has done, the amount of compound that's in the cell or in various parts, it's often higher than the IC50 for the target, and yet you haven't maxed out the antibacterial activity. So the compound is, compound is not necessarily just bound to the target. Mm -hmm. For sure. Everything is more complicated than we think. And speaking of that, here's a question about the contribution of cytoplasmic membrane permeability, which has not been discussed so far. Do you think most of the permeation problem of the cytoplasmic membrane is due to efflux pumps only? No, certainly. Yeah. I, we know that the cytoplasmic membrane and, and the gram-positive membrane and the, and the eukaryotic membrane, for example, have permeability barriers. And, and, you know, Lynn Silver has argued that those permeability barriers are orthogonal to the outer membrane, which, which I tend to agree with. But the other thing we have to consider is that the, an efflux is, it, cytoplasmic membrane efflux, ABC transporters, MFS transporters, mate transporters, uh, play a role certainly for many compounds. But the other thing we know is that compounds don't cross membranes that are very polar or charged. So that means influx across the inner membrane may also be energy dependent or protein dependent. And I think mm -hmm. we have to be aware of that, not to simplify it and say, once you cross the outer membrane, the game's over, because it's not. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yes, but I, I think we are pretty much focused on protein uh, mediated transport across membranes. However, my colleague Klaus Michelea also published a paper on say passive diffusion, which definitely occurs. Uh, so, so, and he uh, indeed has developed an inner membrane model and, and it, it's clear that also say, of course, particularly uncharged compounds can pass uh, the membranes even in the absence of um, say transporters or um, any kind of proteins just by passive diffusion so so in this overall calculation passive diffusion phenomena definitely uh, play a role mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so a question about accounting for uptake independent compound association with cells This could be compound stuck on the surface or compound that is just there by, as Mark just said, processes that are not dependent on specific transporters. Mm. I'm not sure which the um, questioner is thinking about. So one thing that we did at Novartis with our backpack assay is we always did a no cell control to look for poorly behaved compounds that precipitated and were caught on our filters. Uh, uh, and uh, in an early stage project, that was the case frequently. As you proceeded down the funnel and got better and better properties, one usually um, got rid of that problem. Um, but of course, in, in, in practice, one could have compounds that sort of precipitate on bacteria or accumulate in a way that's that's not physiologically meaningful. and. I think there are multiple ways in the literature um, to deal with that with short times or with low temperatures. Uh, and Mark, you've certainly thought about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Lots of wash steps, like, you know, putting wash steps in to wash off um, 
extracellular compound is another way. I would just throw as many controls at it as you can. So I have a question and we should be winding up the next couple of minutes. Uh, testing different compounds of the same series, we often see big differences in the absolute amounts of accumulation. This is fluorescence-based. Do you think the accumulation readout is quantitative or qualitative relative to other compounds? And is the fold change between wild type and toll C a more reliable parameter to guide SAR? Um, I would say if you want it to be quantitative and you want you know, uh, to know absolute amounts of drug, you've probably got to do that versus um, a standard curve of, of, um, of concentration of a drug. Um, so it, um, I think, I think it, it, a lot of the time, depending on how the experiments are done, it, it can, it's, it's relative. If you want to make it quantitative, I think you've got to be very careful and it's got to be, got to be compared to known absolute concentrations. It's. I think, of course, you're on the safer side with, say, just say relative uh, assessments. But um, I, I would really vote for getting accurate quantitative information because for the chemist who optimizes a compound, uh, the data point that is often available is the uh, the IC50 at the target. So or or, or, or association with the target ki value and, and if you have a say good ki value of let's say 500 nanomolar the question is is, is this sufficient uh, and, and if uh, or do you have to uh, get more or do you have to become more potent and there it makes a crucial difference so if your intracellular compound uh, concentration is five micromolar over a longer time then you, you are there with your 500 nanomolar and you don't have to do more However, if you have only 50 nanomolar inside the cell, then it's very clear that you have no chance to, uh, say, uh, kill the bacterium through that target. So you have to become better. And, and, and therefore, I, I think it's really important to know whether you are at 50 or 5,000 uh, nanomolar in, in absolute terms. If you have, say, in vitro absolute association data or, yeah. The other thing that I think people often forget is that even one compound in a bacterium is about a nanomolar concentration, something like seven nanomolar. So if if, if you've got a uh, that Ki value that's below seven nanomolar, you pretty much hit that bottom. Uh, and and yes, your your off rate may may influence that too. But I think once you get down to that nanomolar level, it's all about entry and avoiding efflux. Okay, I have one final question that uh, came in specifically for Mark, saying, are you correlating the target site of activity for antibiotics with where you see accumulation? And for example, tetracyclines, you would expect to be mostly in the cytoplasm if the, since that's where their target is. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah, that's the idea. That's what we're doing. And so I guess, yeah, go, no, go ahead, Mark. Sorry. No, no, no. Please, please say it again. So probably oh, I. No, so I. It reminded me more than that, just... that something I wanted to ask David actually also was so your boronate compounds were designed as to function in the cytoplasm. Does it turn out that in fact that some of them, I mean, designed to be in the periplasm? Did they? Does it turn out that some of them are accumulate in the cytoplasm? We don't have all of that data yet. Um, the compounds that, that we'll be testing will have a, a variety of charges, but a lot of our compounds have a carboxylic acid, a strong acid, and they'll be much less likely to get to the cytoplasm than uh, compounds without that strong acid, without a carboxylic acid. So that's a, a, a easy rule of thumb. If you've got a strong carboxylic acid, you're probably not very good to get into the cytoplasm without a permease. That'll be very interesting. So this has been a, a great discussion. 
three great talks and a lot of uh, of uh, knowledge you are all sharing here. There are a few more specific questions we'll probably be following up with, but I will turn this back over to Astrid. All right. Thanks a lot, Alice, for moderating the webinar. I'm sure it wasn't easy to follow the many, many questions which I sent to you. And just for all of everybody to know, there were a lot more questions I was dealing with. Um, and so we will try maybe to send some of the questions to the speakers and maybe get some um, written responses in the future. Um, of course, a big thank you to all the speakers, Jessica, David and Mark. Thanks for sharing your experience and your knowledge with your, our audience. Um, so now, finally, I would, uh, would, I'm happy to announce our next few webinars. In June, we will have a webinar um, about PKPD or fixed dose BLBLI inhibitor um, combinations by Vincent Tan from the University of Houston followed by a webinar about phase one development of antimicrobials by Markus Teitlinger from the Medical University of Vienna. And in July, we will have a webinar about the challenges and opportunities for antimicrobial R&D in low and middle income countries. This webinar will be presented by Anand Anand Kumar from Buckworks and Kamini Walia from the Indian Council of Medical Research. You can already register for all webinars on Revive, and we will also announce a few more webinars for this summer very soon. So I recommend to keep an eye on our website and on my emails. <laughs> so that's all from my side. I would again like to thank everybody, all our speakers, Alice, our moderator, and also our audience for contributing to the discussion. I really hope that you all find the webinar useful and interesting and that you will join for future webinars. Um, so, sorry. <laughs> um, and please make sure to, to spread the word in your networks and encourage your colleagues to join for future webinars. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and goodbye. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. Bye. Yeah.